Good morning. Welcome to Big Church Sunday. We do this a couple of times a year. It's part of our, our mission to invest in the next generation. We invite our second through fifth graders to come up and experience uh, intergenerational, multi-generational worship with us. Generally, uh, age-specific education is much more effective for them. They get uh, teaching on the level that they can understand. But every now and then, it's really good for them to see how everybody worships across generational boundaries. And so we invite you to come up. And today we're going to do that because we're looking at prayer. And, you know, we remember what it was like to be little. I remember third, fourth, and fifth grade. Third grade, I had Mrs. Bray. She was my teacher. Fourth grade, I had Mrs. Curran. She was my teacher. Fifth grade, I had Mr. Harris, the best teacher I ever had in my entire life. And I am way overeducated, so I've had a lot of teachers. Fifth grade, it was, I kind of peaked in fifth grade. It's, I've been living off that glory ever since. The Red Sox were really good when I was in fifth grade. Um, so last week, we studied about prayer, and we heard what Jesus said about prayer. And specifically, last week, Jesus said what not to do in prayer. He said, don't pray like hypocrites. Hypocrites who pray, pray just to be seen by other people. They're not worried about talking to God. They're worried about looking spiritual in front of other people. So they're not concerned about God. So don't pray as a performance for other people. And then he said, don't pray like, like some of the people in other religions, uh, in, in some of the pagan religions, they feel like they have to get God's attention. You know, first they have to get God to pay attention, then they have to try to impress him with all of their words or with saying the same things over and over and over again. Don't worry about that. You already have God's attention. So last week we saw what God said what Jesus said not to do in prayer. This week, we're going to talk about what Jesus says to do in prayer. Last week was about what not to do. This week is about what to do. Specifically, Jesus is teaching us how to pray, and he gives us the Lord's Prayer. How many people have heard of the term the Lord's Prayer? Anybody ever heard of the Lord's Prayer? Anybody think they can say it off the top of their head? We're not going to make you, okay? Learning the Lord's Prayer is a wonderful thing to do. Memorizing is a wonderful thing to do. Many people have memorized it in a version that we call the King James Version. It's called the King James Version because when it was translated, guess who was king? James was king. Yes, it was about the same time that Shakespeare was written, so it has kind of some these and thous and some language, but as a result, most people know it in that, in that form, and, uh, and so... Um, and if you're ever at a wedding or at a function and somebody sings the Lord's Prayer, I don't know if you've ever heard anybody sing that, generally they're singing this version. So we're going to say this version together. We're going to put it up on the screen. We're all going to say it together. Okay, here we go. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Full stop. I know some of you wanted to continue on there. There is a couple of lines that many of us are used to saying, but probably they were tagged on after after Matthew was written, and they're not bad, they're wonderful to say, and if you say them, that's okay, but they probably weren't in the original version that Matthew wrote, okay? So this is the Lord's Prayer in, that, that was translated in 1611. Now, the good thing is, many of us know that, and it has kind of flow, and that's really great, but there's a couple of words in here that maybe we don't know, because we don't talk like that. So let's, let's take a survey, okay? So... We're going to ask you a couple of questions about this version. All right. What is daily bread? Oh, sorry. What is art in heaven? What is art in heaven? What is art in heaven? Is it a painting class that meets outside? Is it another name for clouds? Art in heaven. Is it that guy who sings Bridge Over Troubled Water? Different art, different art. Or is it 
our Father in heaven. When we say which art in heaven, we're saying you're our Father, you're our God who is in heaven. All right, what's our next question? What is hallowed? What is hallowed? Is it a holiday at the end of October? It is not. It is not. Is it something that has a hole or an empty space in the middle? It's not hallowed. Is it a shining ring that floats above your head? Or is it another word for, your, um, for holy or exalted or not like us? These questions, by the way, are also in your booklet if you have them. And you can circle the right answer. So hallowed means holy. It means um, holy be your name. May you be treated as you deserve to be treated. May you be treated like God. You are holy. We're not. You're special and powerful. We're not. You're perfect. We're not. It's one of the things that we say in the Lord's Prayer. Okay. What's next? What is thy What is thy? We don't use a lot of words like thy. Is it a Greek letter used by fraternities? You know, psi, phi, thy. Pledging that. You know, beta, chi, thy. It's not. It's not. Is it an area on your leg between your hip and your knee? Pull the muscle in my thigh. Running. Is it a painful bump that appears at the edge of your eye? Now, you're following. That's really good. Is it another word for your, as in your will be done? When we say thy will be done, at this time in English, when you were referring to somebody else, you use thy as, we don't use thee and thy anymore. Um, But they did back in 1611 when they translated this. Okay. And do we have one more? What is daily bread? What is daily bread? Is it leftover bread to make croutons? I always assume that croutons are just bread that was left over from yesterday because it's relatively hard, right? What do you do with leftover bread? I make croutons. But that's not what it means. Is it a devotional booklet with scripture and prayer? Yes and no. But not what we're talking about right now, okay? You either get that or you don't, okay? (laughs) Daily bread, is it more carbs than you're allowed? When you're 60, whatever daily bread is, it's probably too many carbs for you, okay? But not if you're nine. A hunk of bread is a great thing if you're a nine-year-old boy. Or is it enough bread for today? Our daily bread, our daily bread. When I say that the this is the most famous translation of the, of the Lord's Prayer. There's nothing wrong with, with memorizing it in the King James and doing that, as long as you know what the words mean, okay? So there's nothing wrong with it. But when I say it's a translation, I say that because Jesus didn't say it in this version. Jesus didn't speak English when he was here on earth. He spoke in a different language. In the Bible, when the Bible was written, when Matthew originally wrote what Jesus wrote, what Jesus said, Matthew wrote it down in Greek. But Jesus probably didn't say the prayer in Greek the first time. He probably spoke it in Aramaic, probably. Aramaic was a Jewish-like language uh, that most Jews in the first century spoke. So uh, it's not that common anymore. But I found a clip, um, and this is Jonathan Rumi. Jonathan Rumi is an actor who plays Jesus in the miniseries The Chosen. I don't know if anybody ever seen that, but he plays Jesus. And one day after they were done filming the scene where Jesus feeds the 5,000, Jonathan Rumi said to everybody, I've learned the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic, and he wanted to pray it while dressed as Jesus. So this is not a film of Jesus. This is a film of a guy playing Jesus, but he is reciting the Lord's Prayer in the original language in Aramaic. So let's go and see how it sounds. Some of you may know that uh, I was taught the 
Our Father in first century Aramaic. And I thought, what better place to recite it here for you than now, tonight? In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Abu Bibashmaya. Neskadashmak. Tefe Malkusak. Newe Semyanak. Aikan Bibashmaya. Ahfara. Rahman de Sunkananyamana. Hablan Yomade, Wash Buklan, Hadi Aikana, Dahanan Shukan Yahaidine, Ulu Elan Lanesian, Lahaina Zelan Mimisha. Amen. Almost perfect, but not quite. Thank you so much. God bless you. So if you were there that first time Jesus taught the Lord's Prayer, it might have sounded like that, except without the microphone part. Um, so every account we have of the Lord's Prayer is a translation. So this is, a, this is what it looks like um, in what the, the translation I usually preach from, the New International Version, uh, which is very similar to the King James Version, but a little bit different. So let me just read it through. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed or holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The Lord's Prayer is in two different places in the Bible. It's in Matthew and it's in Luke. And they're not identical. So what that also means is that Jesus taught this probably more than one time. And he didn't use the exact same words. So that means that we can recite the Lord's Prayer from memory exactly the way we've memorized it. But you also can use it as an outline for how to pray. If you don't know how to pray and you know the Lord's Prayer, you can begin saying it and then and then using it as a way of learning to pray. So what does it say? What does it say? It starts off with, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It begins by saying, God is our Father. Now, as common as that might be for you and me, that was probably a pretty big deal when Jesus first said, You can call God Father. Most people didn't call God Father. And so to be able to say, you get to respond to God as a child speaking to his Father, that means that God is personal. It's not, he's not a life force. He's not an energy. He's not the force that's with Luke Skywalker. He's a person. When we call him Father, it means he's a person. And it means that God is like the best Father that anyone could ever have. Now, take it from me. I'm a father. None of us fathers are perfect. We all do some things pretty well, and we do other things that we're not that good at. And some of you have really great fathers, but they're not perfect. And some of you have had pretty rough fathers. What Jesus is saying is God is like the best ever father. The father doesn't make any mistakes. The father only has perfect um, perfect love for us, perfect acceptance, perfect wisdom. He never flies off the handle. He never goes crazy. He never is worried about his own thing. He only cares about us. He is our Father. So we can, we can come to him as Father. But he's our Father who is in heaven, who art in heaven, who is in heaven. And we ask that his name be holy. That's the other side. He's Father, so we can approach him just like we would our dad, or our grandpa, or our grandmother, by saying it's father, it's not saying that God's male. He's, he's, he's not male or female. He's, he's, he's a, a perfect parent. And so we can approach him the way we would approach the most perfect parent. But 
He is also in heaven and he is also holy, which means he's perfect and we're not. So just in that phrase, our Father in heaven, is really contained the good news of Jesus. The good news of Jesus is included right in that because we believe that God is personal, that God is real, and that he loves us more than anyone else loves us. But he's also perfect in a way that we're not in any way close to being perfect. In fact, the more we look at God, the more, realize, the more we realize just how little we have a right to talk to him. If he's perfect, we're not perfect. We have all this stuff that we've done, and we shouldn't be able to talk to him at all. He should be really, really angry at us for all the bad things that we've done. So we've got this great God who loves us, who should be really angry at us for all the bad things we've done, but in Jesus, those things are taken care of. In Jesus, Jesus died taking the punishment that we deserve so that God doesn't need to punish us or even feel angry at us for all the things that we've done. As some preachers have said, we are more loved than we could ever imagine, but we are worse off than we ever realized. And in Jesus, God forgives us completely and accepts us as a, as a perfect child, even though we're not perfect children. So all that's contained right just in the beginning. Father in heaven, praise be to your name. So, and then it says, thy kingdom come, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that means Jesus saying, when you first go to prayer, spend some time thinking about who God is. Spend some time talking about how he is the God who accepts us and that he's holy and that we're coming to him because of Jesus. That is really good for our soul. It's really good for you to spend some time realizing who God is before you rush into prayer. Now, God's going to hear your prayer no matter what you say. But if you're wondering, how should I pray? Jesus says, let's talk to God about God first. And so we're just recognizing, God, you're like a perfect father. And I'm coming to you in the name of Jesus, because you forgive me. And you're holy, and yet you still love me. And then we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That gets us thinking about, what is God doing in the world? What does God want to do in the world? What does it mean that God is the king of a kingdom? What's God's kingdom like? Well, God's kingdom is made up of all the people who call Jesus king. That's what God's kingdom is. It's made up of all the people who call Jesus king. So you might find yourself praying for people that you love who don't call Jesus king, don't know about Jesus, and never decided to follow him. And you might find yourself, you know, praying about those things. But God's kingdom is also God's will that he would love to have done on earth. What would it look like on earth if everything that happened was what God wanted to happen? And then you start praying about all the things that are kind of wrong in the world. God wants powerful people to take care of people who are vulnerable. He wants rich people to give and support people who don't have as much. He wants people to be treated fairly all the time. He wants us to recognize that everyone is made in his image. He wants us to love like he loves. So then you start thinking about all the things that are wrong in the world, and you might find yourself praying, praying for peace in places where there is war, praying for justice for people who get treated unfairly. You might find yourself praying for some of the people in your school who seem to be going through a hard time. And so your kingdom come, your will be done, because that naturally, then we start to think about, well, what, what does God want me to do to be part of what he's doing in the world? Most of the time when I go to prayer, my first thought is, God, I'm really desperate. Here's the things I need you to do for me today. And there's nothing wrong with that, except if I wait and pray first about who God is, recognize that he knows everything, he understands what I'm going through, he knows all my situations, that he's good, that he loves me, and God is doing these big things in the world, then by the time I get to praying for me, well, I've already kind of put my problems in perspective. So Jesus says, if you want to know how to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, 
This is a good way of talking to God about God and about his will before we get to what we feel so desperately. Not because God doesn't care about what you need. It's not because of that. It's because what you need will be in better perspective when you realize who God is and what he's doing in the world. And so it just helps us before we get to our needs to talk to God about what he's doing. Remember, God loves you, and he's going to listen if you pray in any way. You don't have to pray in this specific way. It's just Jesus' disciples said, teach us to pray. He said, okay, use this prayer and build off of this prayer. Everything you could possibly want to pray, you can pray if you just remember these things and pray off of that. So then we get to the things that we need. Give us this day our daily bread. This is a really strange word. Because it wasn't super common. I mean, its meaning is pretty straightforward. But it wasn't like people went away around saying, um, you know, can I get some daily bread? It seems to be a combination of like our needs and needing things every day. What are the things you need every day? When you wake up in the morning, what are the things you're saying? I hope this happens today. What are the things that are right on your face? That's what Jesus means. You can pray for daily bread. There are a lot of places in the world where people don't know if they have food for tomorrow. So they pray for food today. Most of you probably have food for today and food for tomorrow. And it's okay to pray for the things that you do need today. Strength, wisdom, get over a conflict with a friend of yours. You know, um, you, know you might need healing from something. Whatever's on your heart, it's okay to pray about that. Needs, financial resources. Give us today our daily bread. There was a time, if you remember, some of you people who know your Bible, that when the Jews came out of Egypt and they lived in the wilderness, God actually gave them bread every day. It was called manna. It just appeared on the ground every day. And so that, that helped them to realize that they're dependent on God. It's good for us to realize that we need God every day. That's what that prayer is about. So it says... Give us today our daily bread. And then it says, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Imagine praying that if you're a banker. I just thought about that. What if you're in, the, what if you're in financial management? All these people owe you a lot of money and you're charging them interest. Do you got to forgive all that? I don't know. Well, I think what he's talking about in Luke he uses sins. So debts, and how many people here when you get to debts, you want to say trespasses? Anybody learn the Lord's Prayer with trespasses? I learned the Lord with trespasses. It rolls right off the tongue. Trespasses, as God forgives us who trespass against us. Debts just stops right there. It doesn't flow. But debt hurts a lot more than trespasses. Both of them mean sins. God, forgive me my sins. God, let me be honest with you about the things that I've done that I knew I shouldn't have done. And I want you to forgive me. Now, remember, Jesus died for all of our sins, right? Jesus has already paid the penalty for all of our sins. So God's actually already forgiven all of our sins. Why should we bring them up again? Well, it's good for you to acknowledge God where you've fallen short, where you've sinned, where you've disobeyed. It's good for you. It's good because you're being honest with God and you're being honest with yourself. And for all of us, regardless of our age, if we make asking forgiveness part of our daily prayers, it will have an effect on us. We will change. Eventually, you'll get tired of asking for forgiveness for that, that, that sin. And, and you'll start remembering in the middle of the day, like, if I do this, I'm just going to have to ask forgiveness for it again tomorrow. And I'm tired of it. Now, that doesn't happen if Jesus isn't in your life. But if Jesus is in your life, that's what's going to happen. So praying for forgiveness is really important. It's good for your soul. But then he says, forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. In other words, and help me to forgive the people who've sinned against me. Whew, that's a lot harder. That's a lot harder. The younger you are, the easier this prayer is. The older you get, the more things you've got against other people. The harder it is to forgive people because people have hurt you deeply. And we shouldn't rush forgiveness. Really forgiving people is a process that we need to take honestly and work through. But bringing it before God and saying, 
I, you've forgiven me. I know I need to forgive this person, but I'm struggling with that. Being honest with God about that is really valuable. It's good for your soul. How do I go about forgiving this person? So I don't want to pretend that saying, I'm just going to forgive everybody is an easy thing. Because some of us have some real hurts that are hard to let go of. But it's good to bring it up before God. Because ultimately, when you realize how much God has forgiven you, that's how you can begin to forgive other people. If we can't ever forgive other people, it means that we haven't really grasped how much God has forgiven us. So that's why Jesus said, it's a good thing to talk to God about. And then he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now we're talking, God, I need you. I need you. You know I've fallen short of this, but I need you to help me to be the person you want me to be. So help me to spot when I'm falling into these hints, you know, in, in addiction language, it'd be like, help me spot my triggers. Help me spot those things that help me, that cause me to stumble into sin. Don't, don't let me face those. And when I do, awaken them in my mind so I can turn away from them. And protect me from your enemy, from my enemy, from the devil who wants to destroy me. Help me not to listen to him. Because he doesn't love me like you love me. And he always makes it seem like whatever he wants me to do is a good thing. And it's not a good thing. When you're praying and you're talking to God like at the beginning of the day or at the end of the night when you're going through your day and you're praying, it seems so clear that what what the enemy is saying to us is wrong. Then I don't want to do that kind of stuff. I want to be the person you want me to be. It seems so clear. But then in the middle of the day when the temptation comes, it feels so real and so powerful. So when we ask for forgiveness and then we ask for God to protect us from temptation, that's one of the ways that God protects us as we go. And so when you look at the Lord's Prayer, it's not a magic formula. It's not an incantation because the words we have aren't even the exact words Jesus said. There's nothing wrong with memorizing it and saying it exactly like you've memorized it. That's a good thing to do. But it can also be an outline for all the things to pray about. If you have no idea how to pray, you start praying the Lord's Prayer and let your mind wander. It will lead you to every place. In fact, if you start praying the Lord's Prayer and you let your mind wander and you start praying where it's going, you probably won't even get through the whole Lord's Prayer before you've run out of time to pray. And somebody says, it's time to go to school or have breakfast or, you know, beat on your brother. One One of those things that you just have to do before the day is out, you know? And so Jesus says, this is the way to pray. We pray as an extension of who we are in Jesus. He's forgiven us completely. He's loved us. He's made us his children. We don't deserve to talk to God, but God says you can because Jesus has made it okay. And I can forgive you because Jesus already paid the penalty for your sins. And when we do this regularly, God will change us. He will change us. And so we're going to close in prayer. And then we're going to close in song. And, you know, whether you use the, the old version that has the these and the thous or the newer version, whatever it is, find one and memorize six lines. Memorize it because it'll help you. It'll help you as a way to pray. You'll never be without something to pray. It'll help you when you pray. And you might even notice, you probably didn't notice, that the songs that we sang today are kind of matching the Lord's prayer. So when we sing our next song, I need thee every hour, it is that I'm relying on you. And then when we close in what a beautiful name, it's praising God at the end of the prayer, just like that tagline says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We wanted to show you that the things that we pray for are also the things that we sing. All right, thank you for paying attention. Now you know how to pray. You got it. You got, you got this, okay? Let me pray for all of you, and then we'll worship together. Our Father in heaven, you are perfect and holy and powerful, and yet you also love us like the best Father in the world. And I know that you are building your kingdom, and you're asking us all to cooperate with you in it. So help us to know how to do that. But Father... I pray for each person who is here. 
that you might meet their needs, that they might find peace and joy in bringing to you all the things that they're struggling with and that they need. I pray, Father, that each one of us would leave here having given you our wrongdoing and accepting your forgiveness so that we might leave here protected from the enemy and worshiping you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.